So hello and welcome all uh, to the winter session of uh, C Conversations. C Conversation is the school's engagement with the world that brings in discursive rigor, as well as joys of connecting <clears throat> to new imaginations, voices, and ideas. This is the 18th cycle of C City Conversations, and the series is partly supported by Urban Center Mumbai. <clears throat> The winter series of C Conversations titled States of Matter has six talks from around the world. Uh, this series of talks are curated with research interests in the questions of material, matter, the making of build forms, and new phenomenological conditions of inhabitation. The series will also open discussions with interrogations on the dialectical rela relationship between form and matter, uh, technology and phenomena, between the forest and the factory, the kitchen and laboratory. So with this premise, um, uh, we will open the series with Anuva Sood's work, Between Salt and Water. Welcome, Anuva. Hi. I will introduce you, and then we will have a presentation of your works, followed by discussions and questions from the audience. So Anuva's uh, exploratory practice is devoted to study of biomaterials from bacteria and human hair to her latest seagrasses. Okay. Her formative years have, were spent in India, where she witnessed the environmental and social toll exacted by the textile industry in her native home. Sue's work critiques these current production systems while visualizing a more equitable, sustainable path forward. She sees weaving the intuitive act of making as a personal healing process and a catalyst to physically engage with her environment. Sue received her MFA in fiber arts from Parsons School of Design in New York, USA, and she won the Global uh, Design Graduate Award in Sustainability 2020. Her work has been exhibited at Carpenter Center uh, uh, Gallery in New York, Mana Contemporary in New Jersey, USA, and Australian Tapestry Workshop, Melbourne. Her work has been featured in ID Magazine, Design, uh, in Wallpaper, Interior Design Magazines, and many more. So welcome, Anuba. Uh, we can start with the presentation. All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen real quick. All right. I hope everyone can see it. Yes, it's visible. Okay. Hello, so I'm Anuba, and I will be the first speaker for States of Matter for the School of Environment and Architecture. Um, and I will take you through my work. Um, before, first, I just need to finish the, figure out the technical part of this presentation. Okay, got it. Um, okay. So a little bit about my practice. Um, so mostly I study uh, biomaterials from bacteria, human hair, and later sea grasses. Um, I've spent my formative years in India. I've also worked in India for around six to seven years in the textile industry, where I saw a few practices that I like obviously were detrimental to our bodies of water, to the environment. And so my practice mostly engages with those kind of, you know, questioning those practices in place and how we can visualize a more sustainable path forward. Um, so we will enter this conversation with the study of material. Um, this image is of seaweed and rice that is made into paper. So I have a practice of experimenting a lot. I really take the design process of experimentation really seriously, where I have one idea, but then I have 100 others, and I like to take those diversions. And this is one of the experiments that I did with fermenting rice, introducing paper pulp, and um, seaweed as like a glue to make structures out of. It wasn't a successful experiment, but I just wanted to start the conversation with this. So the study of material is deeply fascinating as it is the depth of objects that constitutes everything around us. Our way of engaging with things has informed the way we interact with material. By freeing material of its practical purpose, I'm interested in exploring its sensorial aspects. Can the material world offer us a new understanding of our environment? So often the way we engage with material is always that we already have a visual form in mind and we figure out the material that we want to use to put that visual form together. 
But what if you free material of its functionality and really explore what it smells like, what it tastes like, what the texture is like, uh, how it reacts, how it responds? Can that you know, help us find new set of information that will um, give us a new understanding of our shared environment with this material? So this is the question that I mainly start my practice with. Um, again, it took some time to arrive here, but like this is predominantly what my practice is centered around. So the first project, so I have two uh, small projects before I introduce Between Salt and Water, just to give you like some background and idea of how I have been working and how I have arrived where I have arrived. So the first one is hair study. This was uh, 2010 to 18. So most of my projects take a really long time because like I said, I love to kind of take diversions in my experimental practice. And those diversions sometimes take up, take up a lot of my time. And I don't mind that because I think that sometimes something completely unexpected comes out of that. And that unexpected can lead to another discovery. So I start with the question of, can we return material as nourishment when I start the hair study 2010 to 18? So this is an image I took of human hair wigs on Juma Masjid Road in Bangalore, India. Uh, what I love about this image is whenever you cross the streets, these women are weaving these long, beautiful wigs. And they always like make it a point to tell you that this is actual hair, it's real hair, it's not fake. It will feel different. So um, in 2010, I was doing my BFA in textile design at Shrishti School of Art, Design and Technology, where one of the projects I researched was the potential of human hair as fiber. Hair is a renewable fiber that is available in abundance. Historically, hair was used as a fiber to create hats, ornaments, insulating material across different cultures. But where did this fiber knowledge really go or did we prefer something else over this? This is just a um, collection of images of how hair has been used in art, in culturally, socially, how it has had like different uses in different like parts of the world. Um, there's also an image here uh, of human hair like up close the scales that was taken by Stanford University. Um, there is a lovely blog uh, called the humanmaterialloop.com history of hair that has this documentation of how, you know, ha how hair, hair has been used as a fiber through different ages. So in my practice, I follow a three stage process. The first one is that you let material guide the process. Basically you let go. So fiber has its own set of knowledge. It can guide you the way it wants to be used. Um, so hair is a protein fiber that can be grown in continuous long strands. Due to its length and scale texture, the easiest way to form textiles was to felt the fiber. Wet felting is one of the oldest form of making textiles, and many cultures have stories about its origin. Felting is a process of matting or compressing raw fibers together, something that happens when you stop brushing your hair. So felting was like the easiest way to put it together. Again, like the image, we'll go back to it. Um, as you can see, like the large scales present on like the human uh, hair fiber. So those scales basically help to kind of form hooks or interlock together when you felt it, when you mat or rub it together. And uh, this was the easiest way to put like the hair fiber or hair material together, just cause like it's very natural. That's what happens. Uh, weaving, knitting, or other forms of putting the fiber together were not necessarily something that would lead to like a durable functional result. So um, I have been collecting hair, my hair, um, since 2010. Um, I've had different haircuts like through the 31 years that I've been alive. And for some reason, I love to kind of save and collect my hair, preserve it like in newspapers, hide it in my wardrobe. My mother would find it when I was young. But anyway, that's a different story. Um, but basically what was interesting is that I was able to kind of collect this fiber and use it. It was always like a resource that I could just like pull out and kind of experiment and try different things with. The next step of the process is observe. 
whenever I'm working with raw or biomaterial, I make sure to document its transformation through time. Um, with hair, it's decomposition process guided the way to another discovery. Human hair is fairly resistant to decomposition. Example, the mummified bodies that you see that has, still have their hair intact. Uh, but in soil, due to the presence of bacteria and moisture, the hair fiber demineralizes within three to five months. As the hair fiber breaks down, it gets released as nitrogen, a nutrient that is scarcely found in soil and is beneficial for a healthy plant growth. So this was something interesting. I mean, when you're working with raw material or with like any biomaterial, it's really important to document how it decays or how it decomposes, because that teaches you or tells you about the lifespan of that particular material. Uh, with hair, I, again, I was saving it since like 2010. Nothing was happening. It was like resting in my wardrobe. So, um, and my mother would find it. But um, like over time, when I started like to study how hair interacts with soil or how can you break that protein fiber down, soil became an import, important part because of the bacteria and moisture present that it would break, that it would help break the protein completely. And it would get released as nitrogen in the soil. Um, so anyway, so there are these two things that will somehow come together. So everything eventually comes together is part three of the process. So um, due to its water retaining capacity and because it can release nitrogen as it decomposes, feathered hair structures are perfect substitute for fertilizer to support a healthy plant growth. So and as we enter a time of adverse climatic conditions, human hair can potentially be a valuable resource um, that can help us return nourishment back to the earth. Um, so that was the idea. And what I started to do is that I started to grow like different like seeds. So I was growing mung bean, chia seeds, all the seeds that I could get my hands on, just to study what happens when this is a particular study where I was like, I'm not going to give that little pot water and I will see how the root structures kind of change or what they gravitate towards. And it was interesting because I had cut the hair fiber in this particular shape and all the root fibers would gravitate towards and take that shape. So I'm really slowly interested in kind of studying those root structures and how they kind of take the form of the mat. It's mainly because the mat was able to retain more water uh, is why that was happening. So this is an organization, matteroftrust.org. And uh, Matter of Trust is an organization that is based in San Francisco, USA. Uh, they are creating human hair mats to combat environmental issue of oil spills around the world. So you can donate hair, you can go take classes there, you can work, you can learn how to felt hair and make mats. Uh, they're also now testing human hair mats. This is like a recent study that was posted. They're also testing human hair mats as manual for growing uh, corn in Chile, especially in areas that are affected by uh, drought. So you can learn about more about it on matteroftrust.org. So this was my human hair journey moving on. Um, the second project that I want to introduce is a yeast bacteria study that I conducted in 2019. So the idea was that can textiles be grown? So this is how I enter the world of materials that are derived from an intersection of nature and design. So I had no idea what I was getting into, but I took a few classes to understand biology and design. And that's when I entered this world of growing bacteria and growing textiles with bacteria. So yeast biomaterial is a material that is made of cellular nanofibrils spun by bacteria and yeast known as SCOBY. As this bacteria culture consumes sugar and other nutrients in solution, it grows thicker and more leather-like. SCOBY is an outcome of an assembly of microorganisms working together to create sheets of material. These sheets of SCOBY can then be separated individually and dried to achieve paper thin material or dried as thicker sheets for a desired width. So just to take, I'll take you through the process. So the first is you get these tubs, large tubs, and you basically make a lot of sweet tea in there. Um, you introduced a yeast bacteria culture. And um, 
similar to like how we make dahi, right? Like you take milk, you boil it, and then you introduce the bacteria culture and it becomes what it becomes. So after like a week, you would uh, notice that there is a thin film of uh, bacteria culture forming on top, which is something you can see in this photograph. And that then that film, this film is actually called the mother scoby. And then that mother slowly over time as it's consuming more and more sugar in the solution starts to become thicker and thicker. So what is beautiful is that these, I mean, this does not look beautiful, but what is beautiful about the process is that these sheets um, grow individually. So you can always pick some up. You don't have to destroy the entire culture. You pick some of the sheets up and dry them and you let the bacteria culture grow thicker. So you can continuously reuse and use the solution over time. Um, so obviously the first step is let material guide the process, let it do the work it wants to do. Um, so because the bacteria culture has grown in sweetened tea, I experimented with the idea of feeding the bacteria a different colored tea. So I was feeding the bacteria butterfly pea tea, which is blue in color, high green tea, which is bright green in color, chai, which is deep brown, uh, jasmine tea, which is white, safflower, which is pink. So um, I wanted, the purpose was to like observe if the material can naturally be colored as it consumes the liquid. So uh, in textiles, we often like do like surface like dyeing, right? Like you dye the yarn or you dye the textile. But here I was more interested in what if you just feed bacteria the color, will it actually start consuming that color and changing? And how would it react? Now, some of these experiments were successful, others were not, as you can clearly see. Um, the Thai um, green tea looks here, looks really sad. And this is what I got after weeks of kind of waiting for the culture, uh, for the bacteria to grow. Um, the butterfly PT was actually kind of successful. Safflower was successful. But yeah, so some of these experiments turn out great, some don't. But this was just an idea that I kind of wanted to test out. So the second step of the process is observe, you take a step back and you see how it is reacting or how it decomposes. So here at the stage two material derived from the bacteria culture, it was durable. The texture, in texture it was more close to waxed paper, I would say, than like leather. Uh, one limitation was that the material was permeable. Its reaction to water would instantly return it to its natural gelatinous state. To make the material water resistant led me to another experiment, take diversions, uh, which was feeding bacteria khaki shibu, which is fermented persimmon fruit juice. Um, so it's a natural lacquer and a tannin that is used to preserve uh, Japanese wood and paper cut. So when I was studying of how I can naturally make this water resistant, I actually collaborated with a scientist in Korea who told me about urushi, which is a natural tree lacquer. But urushi is horrendously expensive. I was a student with no money. So then I started researching on other ways of kind of to, you know, make it water resistant. And I came across kaki shibu. Kaki shibu is, uh, again, for fermented persimmon fruit juice. And it's mostly used in natural dyeing as a tannin. So basically to in induce light color. And um, so when I was um, when I was reading more about it, I also learned to preserve like Japanese wood and paper cut to make them stronger. They would use a coat of kaki shibu on top. Now, warning, kaki shibu and uh, yeast bacteria do not smell good. And together they do not smell good at all. But anyway... So the first step was that I introduced khaki shibu into the bacteria culture to see if the bacteria actually starts consuming khaki shibu and what if it naturally grows as like water resistant, completely failed. Um, then I tried an experiment of maybe layering, like putting, brushing it onto the surface and seeing what happens. That was fairly successful. Um, so these were just like a series of few experiments that I did to figure out what is the best way to kind of make this material water resistant. Everything doesn't always come together um, with this project specifically. So, um, sorry. So with this study, I, I was studying yeast bacteria for over one year and I left my research because something just did not feel right. 
um, I just could not resolve the idea of growing and killing microorganisms solely for the purpose of our consumption. Um, it just, I don't know, it was something, first the material wasn't necessarily the most durable or functional material. Um, second, I just could not come to terms with the fact that we are growing this culture, then like, you know, taking it and then killing it. Of course, it's not the same as like, you killing like animals for leather, but again, it's not necessarily a substitute for leather either. So it was just like, there was a lot that was unresolved and I couldn't come to terms with. So I left the study anyway. So from these two studies, like we know that growing material does require tenderness. Um, these materials are affected by many variables like moisture in the air, quality of the soil, and other microorganisms present. Like so often when you would be growing bacteria culture, you know, fungi would, fungus would start growing with it, or like something is happening, you know, other microorganisms that you don't want to be interfering in the process would. Um, so we know that intensive research and experimentation are integral to my making, but I'm most interested in the accidents. This random moment of language and communication that is part you and part the material that you are working with. And I feel that that is like the true collaboration that does take place when it's part your work and part the material that you're working with. Um, so with this, we take a breather and we enter the next section, which is between salt and water. So after graduating from Shishi in 2014, I worked as a textile consultant, sourcing sustainable production and manufacturing routes for uh, textile retailers. As a part of my job responsibility was to visit manufacturing facilities to observe the textile practices they had in place. In 2014, I frequently visited few facilities that were located around Belindur Lake in Bangalore. Belindur Lake is infamous for being polluted with sewage and covered with toxic foam that actually caught on fire in 2015, one year after. For me, this experience was very surreal and disorienting to be driving through uh, clouds of toxic foam literally floating in the air. Um, it was really funny because like, I think I was like 20, 24 years old or something. And I was like, oh my God, it's like snowing in Bangalore till I like, realized it's actually toxic foam. Um, Everything we know that is interconnected, all our actions contribute to the larger ecosystem and having witnessed practices that are detrimental to the environment had a huge impact on my practice and thinking today. The health of these rivers have everything to do with textile processes and waste. The same linkage determines the health of our oceans. Now so saturated with microplastics cast off by synthetic fibers that certain species of fish are permanently altered. Our bodies are also altered. And though many of us do not immediately connect water to cloth, the use of water is embedded in each step of the cloth's manufacture. The application of dyes, the addition of specialty finishing chemicals, and final rinsing all take place in and affect bodies of water. So when I was so after this, when I moved to the US to do my MFA at Parsons, I knew that I kind of wanted to obviously build this study, you know, take it forward. And water was something that was important to my practice. And I definitely wanted to address this. So we enter between salt and water, which is a study that has been going on from 2019 to 2022. So between salt and water focuses on the study of sea grasses and ocean water that is collected from three oceans and studied through dyeing, weaving and material softening processes. The focus of the collection of experiments is to observe how the material configures itself to reveal new kinds of information. In this case, the relationship between our production processes and the natural world. So when I started the study, I have been gathering um, water. So when I when this idea first came to me, I was going around New York and I was collecting water from lakes um, what, and like, you know, different foraging, different like plants and seeds and etc. that I could collect around the parks. Uh, and soon enough, I learned about E. coli and I stopped doing that. Um, and then the idea was maybe, you know, because when you do natural dyeing, you have to 
add a lot of salt to the water. So for the dye to get activated and to actually um, stick to the fiber. So the idea was, what if I start collecting ocean water? You know, it will be a catalog of or a result of my personal migration because my family was everywhere. Uh, one holiday, I had to go meet somebody somewhere like in Singapore, some someone in Ireland, someone because everyone had kind of separated and moved in different parts of the world. So I was just like, it could be an interesting kind of catalog of my personal migration to really like, you know, collect water from these different oceans and weave the ocean together. Um, and slowly, as I was doing that, you know, one part of the process is just to take a long walk and figure it out. So I um, saw these sea grasses and I started kind of weaving them. And um, some strange, magical things happened. So. I'll take you through my process for between salt and water because considering it's also like a long study. So the first process was obviously to collect, like I mentioned. So I started collecting um, ocean water and sea grasses from these different parts of the world. Um, I mean, over time, I've obviously collected from more places, but this is not updated anyway. So Coney Island, New York, uh, Lower Bay, Atlantic Ocean, Galway, Republic of Ireland, Atlantic Ocean, Koh Tao, Thailand, Gulf of Thailand, North Pacific Ocean, Singapore, Indian Ocean. Um, so I, I would go to all these beaches, like the strange human being that I am with like these containers and I would fill them up with um, ocean water and, and collect seaweed in these bags and bring them home. So this is what I had collected from Coney Island, all these different colors of seaweed and ocean water and little samples of algae. This is Galway, Republic of Ireland. So this was like kind of a terrifying story. Uh, when we were um, driving through like Galway, we actually saw a huge mass of land that was covered in kelp. And at that time, I didn't know what that was. And later when I read about it, we found like, I was really excited. So I ran to the beach and I started collecting these samples. I'm like, oh my God, sample of red kelp, sample of bull kelp, let's bring that home. But later when I went home to actually research on these different types of kelp, we realized that that is actually a subsurface of wasteland that is being accumulated with time due to the adverse climatic conditions. So there is this massive wasteland that is basically gets like accumulated and like formed around the coast of Galway in Ireland and different parts of the world, which is just like kelp being washed up because of the water warming up. So this is me again, like collecting kelp in Galway um, and then bringing it home, uh, separating it, drying it, cleaning it and drying it. Um, and studying different types of kelp on my own in my little laboratory. Um, this is in Koh Tao, Thailand, where I came across something really cute and beautiful, which is sea grapes. Uh, you can find them floating around. Uh, you can pick them up, wash them, put some um, chili sauce on them. They're delicious. Uh, they don't give any color in natural dyeing, but anyway, they were something unusual. Um, now we come to this part two, which is color. So after collecting all of the, the seaweed that I collected, the next step was to segregate it according to color. Um, and after some research, I was able to identify a few types of seaweed. Uh, together with the collected ocean water, the grasses were boiled to study color and the samples were tested on silk chiffon. So these were just a few types of seaweed that I was able to identify that I had collected from these different, um, you know, parts of the world. And then I was boiling them to study color that whether I'm going to get something or not, I had no idea. So the silk chiffon samples were just basically, um, I had to boil them in alum. And the, I mean, alum doesn't like change the color. It doesn't like alter the color at all. All it does is that it just helps the dye to stick to the fiber and that's all it's doing. So for two hours, you just have to boil the samples in alum um, to activate the dye and the fiber and for it to stick to the fiber. This is a range of colors that I got in the first time of um, dyeing the seaweed. And then I added iron as a modifier. 
Um, so to get like a deeper range of color, you can simply dip the dyed samples into iron and um, that just basically makes it darker. Uh, to get black dye, uh, I mean, if, you, if you've seen like samples from um, 18th century or something where you have, or even your grandmother's like silk, there is something called silk shattering that happens. It's because uh, when silk samples are dyed with iron, it basically tends to, it destroys the fiber entirely. So the fiber starts to break completely. And silk shattering is something really beautiful and people who are interested should look it up. Um, and it, it is a problem, but it's also something that is very unusual that happens because of iron that is used in the dye to get black color because black is not found in the natural world. Uh, we would always have iron as a modifier. Um, the next step was paper felting. So when I was um, dying and getting all these colors, um, dying, when I was uh, dying these um, samples of CV to get all these colors on silk chiffon, uh, one thing that would happen in the dye bath, which is a pot where you, which you are using, to uh, boil the seaweed and the water together and act, um, and basically um, dye the fabric, there would be a lot of dye matter that would be left. So a lot of seaweed after boiling would be left in that dye bath. And I like, I didn't know what to do with it. So I would just pack it up and like throw it. But then later, like I was working with somebody from Fiber House Collective, um, who is very knowledgeable about paper making. And she told me that, why don't you look up uh, ancient paper making techniques? Because seaweed was actually used as a gluing agent. So which was really interesting, because even when I would be throwing that seaweed bath, I would always notice that it is a little bit gluggy. And um, then I was reading about it and I found a ch uh, Chinese paper making technique, ancient Chinese making paper making technique that would use seaweed as a glue. Um, and I could instantly connect it also to our Indian way of paper mache, where we use methi powder to actually act as glue for paper mache. It's really smelly, but you can try it. Um, so that was one way that, so I started experimenting. This is me kind of making paper. I used um, a, the, the proportions were that I was using like rice, starch. I was using 10% paper pulp. I was using um, seaweed mainly, and I would make it into this pulp and I would basically spread it on sheets and let it dry. So this is me drying seaweed at my sister's house who was screaming in the background. Um, so this is how you dye um, seaweed, right? So you just take a pot, you take the water. And for me, like I was like studying it with the ocean water also. So I was also boiling the ocean water, boiling the seaweed and putting the samples in. And this is how you can see like how it's taking color. All of this matter would be left. So all of the seaweed would be left back in the pot. So I think it was like this paper making was like an easy way to kind of use that leftover material. This is some of the works that I did on that paper. These are tapestries that I made because I was dying and, you know, getting all these colors from that seaweed. So I started using the paper that I made from that seaweed and then using the yarn that I dyed with that seaweed over it to make tapestries. This one took forever because it's kind of large. All of these are made on CV paper. And this is just a sample of me laser cutting CV paper. So the next step is um, softening. Um, so when I was collecting all the seaweed, it wasn't just me collecting. A lot of my friends, families who knew that I was doing this uh, project would basically send me samples of seaweed. So people who had gone to like Hawaii would ship me like samples from Hawaii. People from Korea were shipping me samples. People from India were shipping me samples. So I had all this like kelp and seaweed that in my house at that point, and I just did not know um, how I can preserve it because it would dry up, turn brittle and start to break. And you know, some of the, some of, 
some of the formations were so beautiful that you would want to preserve it for like longer so that you can study it so that you can use it later maybe for something else. And some of the types of seaweed cannot be dyed to get color out of. So how do you preserve that? So I, um, so I did this experiment and I was like, okay, let's study softening, which is basically a process to replace the water content of the seagrass with another liquid substitute. So the first idea was obviously kakishibu, my favorite, uh, that made a comeback. Uh, there was another idea of microwaving it, which was terrible. That is just to dry the water out entirely so that you get a dry material. Um, and then boiling it to get the salt out. Finally, I arrived on a glycerin-based solution, uh, which actually proved to retain the material softness, preventing it from drying. So these are just a few studies. This was the raw material study. We will come back to it. Something really beautiful started to happen when I did this little weaving on um, using the raw material that is unprocessed entirely. It started to form these salt, a layer of salt crystals on top. At that time, I was terrified of it. And I just left the study because I'm like, okay, I don't want to deal with these salt crystals. I want it to you know, become soft and like to preserve it, not to decay this way. But we will come back to this. Uh, microwave study, which is basically a biscuit. Um, this is the kelp in amassed in the solution of glycerin and uh, part water. Uh, I had to do a couple of studies, obviously, to arrive at the time that you can actually immerse the um, kelp in. Um, and, you know, if you would leave it for too long, it would start to form these sugar crystals on top. If you leave it for too less, it would like start growing again, like bacteria and other things on top. So I had to like go through a couple of tests to figure out the best like time to actually leave it in the solution and to cure it. These are a few samples that I did uh, with laser cutting uh, on softened kelp. Um, then we have all the softened kelp, what do we do with it? Um, so then I started to weave, weave is something again, that is like my medium, my practice. It's something that I do when I don't know what else to do. Um, when you don't know what to do with your hands, for me, it's like weaving, you know, it's something that is very intuitive. So, um, I took uh, the raw and the treated seaweed and started studying it for like woven constructions on hand loom and on baking trays, basically whatever I could make a loom out of. Uh, this is me cutting the kelp um, and I hand cut it approximately to 0 0.4 centimeters. I sat down and cut hundreds of pieces of kelp to work on the project. Uh, and then I was like testing out how you could kind of make structures out of it. Could you, could it just take form? Do you have to like mold it on something? So some of these were actually successful. Um, this is a raw material study, which is basically completely unprocessed CV that is on a baking tray. Um, you know, like I, I spoke about the crystallization that was happening, the salt crystals that would form on the surface. So I was interested to like, you know, create a larger piece and see what happens. So this is me weaving like a large sample. Um, and this is a processed material study, which is that the CV was softened. Uh, sorry, the kelp was softened and then woven. Uh, the color becomes a lot more brighter, obviously, because of glycerin. Um, this is something, this is a piece that I wove on the hand loom. Um, this is made out of kelp and linen. So you can see how bright the color gets because of glycerin. This is also another piece that I wove. Um, the yarn is also dyed with red kelp. And this, is use, this uses uh, rattan sticks. This was for a project for Steinbeis experimental gastronomy used as like a table linen. This was also for Steinbeis experimental gastronomy in Denmark. This was a vessel that I made out of um, kelp. I was inspired by sea urchins, so I made a sea urchin vessel.
So after all of this work, I think what was missing is breadth into your work. So how do you add breadth to your work? I feel, yes, that, you know, we, I was using CV, I was doing all of this, but like something just did not feel completely resolved again. Um, because again, I was taking this material, processing it, using it the way I wanted to use, like it just did not feel like um, the right kind of, you know, I, I wanted to push the project a little bit. So while I was finishing my MFA thesis in 2020 is when the pandemic hit. Um, so it was quite challenging, obviously, to say the least. I had to pack up and relocate my entire studio in my tiny apartment in Brooklyn. This obviously required a lot of adjustment and acceptance at that time, but now I feel like it has influenced my practice in a good way. Um, I had my hand loom in my bedroom so I could wake up from my bed. Again, it's a tiny apartment, so you can visualize it. I literally would get up from my bed and my hand loom would be there and I could start weaving. I could start using it to do make projects. Uh, I had access to the kitchen um, and, you know, I could study making algae biomaterial. I could extract dyes from spices, from fruits, do like all kinds of things. Um, so I am very excited about this union of textiles and the kitchen, and I hope to delve more into it. Um, I think always remembering that everything is returned to the earth as poison or as nourishment is an important thing to remember. Um, it's so simple and so powerful when we just think of the earth as another living organism. So adding breath to the work. Um, so like I said, this all crystallization and sculpting. So I was working with seaweed as a raw material and without it being processed or treated in any way. And I wanted to see what that raw fiber does, like what happens. And it started to crystallize and that crystallization process would literally just take like a few kind of like one and a half days or two days, depending on the scale or the size of the sample. And it performed like this beautiful layer of soil over it. And initially, obviously, like I mentioned that I was like kind of intimidated by that. I didn't know if I wanted to continue taking this project forward because it was just like it seemed strange and otherworldly. But later, like I started to kind of form this relationship with these samples where you know, I started noticing when the air in my apartment was warmer, it would react and change form. When the air was cooler, it would change and react and change form again. Um, and for me, like I think of these as living organisms because they're constantly responding to your environment. They're constantly responding to the changes that are happening. And any like shift or change in its immediate environment, it changes form, it changes the trans, it transforms. So um, that I thought was really beautiful because even the, the idea of adding breath to your work, it was like, this was literally breathing, living or an organism. So again, like documenting or noticing how it transforms with time is something really crucial when you are working with raw or um, raw material. So this is the transformation that would take place from complete green, it would literally turn entirely white in a matter of like days. I can play this video. Let me see if it does play. It has no sound, but this is me. Again, this is COVID. So everything has been documented on my iPhone. Oops. So yeah, so I think this documentation process was really crucial because I kind of saw that how it was transforming and responding to air and other factors, moisture. Um, and I wanted to work more with that concept. So these are my living entities. These are my living structures that I wove. Um, and these took a while. Initially, I wasn't going to use them as a project because I'm like, they're not like, you know, usable or what are they going to do? They're going to decay, they're ephemeral. But I really actually over time have started to appreciate the fact that they are ephemeral, that they're not, they're designed to live for a short time. Mm -hmm. 
This was for Carpenter's Workshop Gallery in New York. So the Between Salt and Water series draws attention to the decline of kelp forests and their role in maintaining the Earth's ecological balance. The pieces use fresh kelp woven into a sculptural form that responds to air over a period of time. When exposed to air, the kelp produces salt crystals on its surface, which absorb humidity and prevent it from drying. These works are both handcrafted sculptural objects of contemplation and living entities that will evolve with the passage of time. I see these pieces as living organisms the forms, structures, and even smell of all fluctuate in line with their environmental conditions. This is crucial to my practice as it involves confronting the inevitable impermanence of any living organism. This is also the very nature of working with organic materials. They will change and slowly disintegrate. Through my work, I hope to offer a glimpse into a world that we have rendered inhospitable and urge to rethink the ways in which we engage with the natural world to step away from systems that we have already identified as violent and in need of change. The end result is not cloth per se, or even fully realized sculpture. The forms are more like gestures for contemplation, placed in your path, commanding us to pair unlikely cohabitants and to ponder the why. I wanna end this talk with, um, this uh, book from Bruno Munari, it's called The Sea as a Craftsman. And um, I love this little section where he says that you throw something into the sea. And after, you know, an unspecific time, it will carve, finish, smooth, polish the material and give it back to you. You don't know if it, you're going to get it back in the same place where you gave it, gave that material, but you will get it back. Um, and it will take, the sea takes its own time and it only works when the moment is right. It's not working to recreate things in the same way that things have been made. Everything is unique and it will take its time to kind of work as a craftsman and give you something that is truly unique. And these were the pieces that he collected from the beach. And that's it. Thanks, uh, Anuva. It was a great presentation. I think uh, there was a lot to sort of see through and um, you know a lot of uh, thoughts and new ideas which sort of came up. And um, part of our um, uh, research in the school also uh, dealt with um, uh, you know, starch-based composites. So mm -hmm. we kind of quite relate to this, um, uh, you know, kind of work or the direction that you take, but it ad adds interesting um, ways to sort of enter the question of materials. Um, and I think that we uh, we generally sort of rush too much or kind of pre-assume or over-assume our position in terms of um, kind of finalizing or kind of you know, kind of arriving at a material um, and kind of immediately giving it a certain purpose that it it kind of um, has to uh, serve uh, uh, humanity or, or 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 some other kind of uh, you know uh, industrial sort of logic. But I think in in the interesting thing that came up from from your uh, work is is the way you enter to the question of um, not uh, like freeing the material from its practical purpose. And I think. I think that kind of gives in a very interesting way to engage uh, with uh, with the qualities or the kind of um, things that the material has to offer. And I think many of your uh, processes uh, sort of dealt with softening, um, with this uh, approach of tenderness. And I think that uh, and I think that kind of really uh, pulled out our um, understandings of. Um, you know, the industrial materials that we uh, kind of, or maybe the ex extractive logics that we sort of work with uh, into 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 a newer sort of uh, relationship. Um, and I call this, and I, and I, and actually while writing the note, uh, 
uh, we, we sort of call this as uh, uh, human to uh, a another species sort of relationship. No, so there is a human to human relationship. There's a human to a non-human relationship. So I think it kind of somewhere fits within those. Um, to, I just want to add um, to this before sort of we open, um, like the way in which I think you derived um, the process processes. Um, um, it also kind of comes from the uh, from the engage the phenomenological engagement that you had with the material. So I I think opening that into as a discussion I think would um, would give us a, a good entry into this, and maybe that there's one more question that I want to take up a little later. Um, but yeah, if you could uh, elaborate a little bit on. Um, I'm sorry, elaborate a little bit on the processes. Yes, I mean the the way you sort of enter the uh, the question of material, and um, so yeah. I'll just maybe specify it. Maybe yeah. the time that you took really to um, yeah. identify and arrive, like right from the fibers of the hair uh, hairs to uh, the fibers that actually came from the seawater, the salt water, yeah. or the ocean. Uh, so I think that time frame and the kind of e and time that each experiment really took to to work things out. So, mm -hmm. and also within that, like when did the process really emerge or when did the, uh, you know, the steps really, I know it was a quite an experimental thing, but just yeah. Again, yeah. Um, I think that one thing that, so before this, when I was working as, and when I was weaving or doing like all the other projects that I worked on, I was actually using like a lot of materials like copper wire, you know, to make uh, textile that can be moved, sculpted, this and that, you know, making it functional and usable, you know, introducing light and doing all these like crazy ideas. I think the shift really happened when, again, like the hair is something that I was working on in 2010 and actually when I was in Bangalore in Shishti. Um, I never took that project forward because I think for that time, it was really unconventional. Um, and I was not necessarily encouraged in that direction. Um, so I was like, yeah, maybe this is too strange. I just shouldn't take it up. And I kept returning to it because this is something that I just do very intuitively. Like I have a habit of saving my hair because I'm like, you know what? I'll just save it. Like I, right now I'm saving my white hair because I'm turning old. So, so I take that and I save it. I'm like, you know what? I'll use it for something, it's fiber. But it maybe it was just the relationship that I have. I think that when you are working with the natural world, it's not Lego. It's not like taking taking bricks and constructing and building that. You know, you can't apply the same approach. There are so many variables that affect when the natural material you are working with. Um, so many times I would end up in tears because you know initially to even like to get to this process you know, to be comfortable with this process when I was just simply experimenting with, say, for example, the yeast bacteria. Um, so many times there was like fungus that would start growing on the layer of these bacteria and I couldn't use it anymore, you know. Um, and I was just like, I spent three weeks in growing this <laughs> and now there is this happening. What do I do? And I was talking to one of my professors in at Parsons who was just like, but that's just going to happen, you know? So eventually just accepting those kind of happenings, those uh, discoveries, those accidents is very crucial in this way of thinking because you're like, you have to accept that. And sometimes they're happy accidents. Sometimes you've just wasted a lot of time. So, <laughs> so um Again, it really depends, but it's like that complete change of approach that you kind of have to adopt. It's not constructing, it's not building, it's growing. And that requires a very different kind of relationship. Yeah, so I think the, the other point that you mentioned just now, the time that you took to really engage with the material, it built your intuitive sense of um, engaging or kind of you know working with the material, and I think that that's something that you know uh, we sort of miss um, miss now in that sense, like you know the spending of time with each material, what it kind of speaks to you, and and the other thing which I also want to uh, bring in is this um, the process that that emerged is is also like let the material guide 
uh, you know your act your actions or how what you do with it and and then kind of coming to observe and then you know kind of comes together and i think that that time allows really that kind of process to process to happen the other thing that i would want to also um uh, open up is the is the space in which all of these experiments were happening like they were all homes of your friends of your family <laughs> and your travel and the ocean really connected all of these homes no i mean all, all of these spaces and and the kitchens or maybe the the backyards they became the space where probably you know all of these experiments really uh, emerged <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for the spaces, um, initially, again, like when I was doing the yeast bacteria experiment, for example, um, that doesn't smell so good. Um, so because the bacteria is slowly like growing and it's becoming thicker, thicker, so it starts to smell a lot. And I would I had tubs of bacteria growing in my all my friends' houses because <laughs> I couldn't fit those tubs anywhere else. And like my school space at Parsons was, wasn't it, like they didn't have a space to actually do this kind of work. Later, I actually found a group uh, of like bio designers at the school who taught me a lot about these processes and like how to kind of, you know, build these spaces in your house or like, you know, that are also like healthy in space, um, healthy in terms of like, you know, the if there are fumes or if there are like when it's drying or like when there is smell you need to like you know how to ventilate these spaces there's also a healthy materials lab at Parsons that had like a lot of resources on like how to kind of you know engage with these materials but when I was doing textiles there was no really like there was no space because again my work is not cloth per se right so um, it was a lot of kind of begging your friends to kind of let you grow this under their couch <laughs> and hoping that like it's going to be OK. And, you know, the heat is enough for it to keep continuously grow and stuff like that. So, I mean, again, like the time that it took, it took because it was just something that is complete, that is always going to be out of your control, you know. So also like in this spaces, all of these spaces, the, the setting up of the apparatus or maybe the conditions under which uh, each of these material took shape, were, or were they kind of really uh, precisely controlled um, with temperatures, with moisture or other things, or it was just kind of, you know, it was, it, it happened within that space or the, the, the conditions were favorable to, for it to really be what it had to be. So um, when I start the experiment, when I'm like, you know, when there's an idea, then I just, I don't think about those settings because I'm just like, yeah, let's just go ahead with the idea and see. I'm not a scientist. So for me to learn is through like my experience or my engaging with that material. So when I know that, okay, this is not working, then I would go and like, I would be like, okay, let's get in touch with other people who have engaged with this, who can inform me better of what I need to do. And then I would build those settings where like I could actually, or I would borrow those like spaces, like I mentioned, like, you know, materials lab and all of that, where I would work with people who have more knowledge of this and who could like teach me about how to build those kind of environments for this. Uh, when I was working on the carpenters, like the living structures, the exhibition, um, I had actually, uh, this work could only exist for a certain amount of time because they did not have a temp temperature controlled environment. So even during the exhibition, the work would just keep changing and transforming. So the way that I've sculpted this textile is that I have actually used certain objects to sculpt it over. And when it would become solid, I would lift it as a sculpture, as like a three-dimensional object, and then I would bring it to the gallery. But because it wasn't like temperature controlled, the objects start to change responding to the environment in the gallery. So not everybody is going to be okay with it. You know, I had to kind of talk to a lot of people and like deal with that aspect of the work. But that is a part of the work, you know, especially with this body of work. So, um, I mean, again, like you can't have those favorable environments everywhere, uh, you know, where the work exists. And some, when it leaves you, it leaves you and it's going to exist on its own anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I think it, it takes time for people to really uh, accept that something can, an object can perish, you know, like, yeah, exactly. seen, yeah, the, the ephemeral world, is uh, definitely 
the ephemerality is definitely like a aspect of the work that I had to like really work into like explaining what happens, you know, because uh, especially with like gallery settings and all of that, where they're hoping to like, you know, for it to last forever, you know, can I, can I spray it with like something that will stay like this? So um, I kind of stayed away from that approach because I'm like, you know, this is an ephemeral body of work. There is other work that can last for longer, for example, the work that I did with softening kelp, this can last for like this. I mean, I have samples with me that have lasted for like three years, four years. But again, it's not going to last forever, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I think um, I've discussed a few points and I would like to also invite um, uh, people from the school uh, to to kind of have their own questions or maybe some uh, additions to these thoughts. Someone, um, so we have um, a question from mm -hmm. an anonymous attendee. Uh, okay. I'll just read it out to you. Uh, Hello Anuba, I really love your presentation and the idea of using kelp as a process which shows the delicacy and even the formation of a relationship. I'd like to ask you to elaborate more on the observations you saw while experimenting on the kelps and the way they grow and respond to the ecological system. Mm -hmm. um, so with the kelp, again, like, it was like a series of like, you know, experimentation. Let me bring out the initial slide of the steps. Yeah, with the kelp, um, again, like, like I said, when I was just collecting it, I was just simply weaving it again. Like I wasn't the first one who has woven seaweed or kelp into like textiles. Sheila Hicks has done everything before everyone. But, but um, it was more of the idea of, you know, fine, weaving is like one way of engaging with it. But I think that slowly as I was working with it and I was collecting, the first thing that I, I wanted to talk about was the, the subsurface of wasteland that I saw in Ireland that was forming, right? Where I was super excited at first. I'm like, oh my God, free kelp, like so much, pick it all up because otherwise you have to what? Like, you know, source it from somebody, you know, get into a relationship with people who can like, you know, bring you kelp ethically. Um, but I was just like, oh my God, there's so much. I can pick up bull kelp, I can pick up red kelp, I can study this. But over time, when you like read about what's happening, you understand that it's because the water is warming up, that it's washing up on the beach. And I kid you not, like it wasn't just a little bit. <laughs> it was land. It was actual land. From a distance, it looked like an island. So uh, I have photographs of this and I am happy to share maybe after the conversation, but like it was literally an island of kelp and that was like super disturbing just to like see what was happening. And, um, you know, in my work initially, I mean, I came with the thought where I'm like, you know, I'm going to work with it and make it into a well, material. You know, that was like my designer thinking where I'm like, it's going to become a material. It's going to become a durable thing. It's going to become the substitute for something. But eventually, you know, when I was working with it and me going back, not to the softening of it, but to using it in its raw state, the way it is, was something that was a very important like step that I had to kind of, you know, commit to. Because, you know, I'm like, I know a lot of people will have a problem with the salt crystallization and it completely forming and like decaying in front of them because the because I'm also spending so much time in making these pieces and these pieces will only last for a short time. But the beauty of that happening in front of your eye where something from completely green, an object that has been woven is completely transforming is exactly a metaphor of the climate and of our environment today. You are witnessing that change. And I think that story was very important with my relationship when I was working with this material. That story had to be communicated. And the way I could do it is not by making it do something, was to go back and to see how it's actually responding. Um, I hope that answers. But, yeah. yeah, I have a following, say, comment or maybe a question. Like yeah. uh, this uh, change in, in environment, is is producing newer i would i would call them newer um, uh, raw materials to sort of work with because mm -hmm. there were other processes probably earlier which 
the the fossils which kind of made oil or or maybe mm -hmm. the uh, sedimentation which kind of make made a few rocks and we extract and you know that 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 has been our process and i think now um with uh, sort of, with, with a certain shift in the environmental say configurations uh, there are newer materials or newer raw materials which are emerging like for example in your case the kelp became one of those uh, raw materials from where your uh, journey or your practice to work with materials or a pursuit to uh, uh, make a newer material sort of happen and and i think that i mean and that relating that to your say practice and the process that emerged from a certain practice uh, i think it, this this is a very interesting sort of uh, case right now. I mean, there's one case where we can't um, um, stop uh, certain environmental shifts that are happening. We can definitely help reduce or be a little more um, uh, sensitive about them. But on the other hand, I think these shifts will also produce many more such um, uh, raw materials for us to really work with. Or maybe uh, from Bruno Munari's um, uh, work, when he says that it'll come back as a as a shiny object, I mean, there would be many new things where, which the ocean will kind of bring back to us, which maybe we have kind of put into the ocean again. So I'm just trying to kind of build us, in, I mean, build this kind of a uh, ecology of newer raw materials that would sort of start emerging uh, yeah. in our, in our practices and our kind of... Yeah. I think the issue is not that like, I think there is so much new, there is so much material potential anyway, right? We have so much material, again, like we have just assigned a function to certain materials that already exist. You know, they have potential of becoming something completely different, but we haven't experimented enough. I think the problem with like design processes right now is that we don't spend enough time experimenting. The school curriculum is such that like you have to finish this project in two months, right? So like, you know that you have to come up with the deliverable in two months because you have to graduate. But things take time, you know, like experimentation takes time. And sometimes a project can be incomplete completed. You know, it doesn't matter. Like it, it will take its time with with also like I feel that like our way of thinking we're so busy of finding like substitutes like even with the yeast bacteria if you go online you'll literally read about it it's like leather substitute leather substitute like we are so busy finding a substitute for leather for what so you know to stop using leather there is yeah. so much other material out in the world that can be used instead of leather yeah. so I feel that it's just like we are so hooked on to the ways things things work that we are still functioning in that space of that's how they should be. So I think that entire change in way of thinking takes time and we as designers are the ones who can actually start that. You know, we as thinkers, designers, artists, wherever you situate yourself, you know, we are the ones who can actually start kind of introducing these ideas and make that change because you, when you're working with an organization, most like 90 to 70% of the decision making of how the material will end up, what the lifespan will be, happens in the design room, mm. right? Yeah. After that, manufacturing takes over. They anyway apply like thousand kinds of finishing and then it exists the way it exists. And then it's probably going to live forever, right? But I think that we as designers, like if we know that that 90% of that that decision making is going to influence the rest of that product's lifespan, then we have to be accountable for how we are interacting with the world. But it also kind of brings in um, a question on what the what the practice is and and practice in the sense that how we consume or how we interact with our with objects around us because we are not culturally conditioned to accept a perishable. Uh, building or a perishable object or a perishable, uh, you know, kind of material around us, which we have manufactured. And I think, uh, I think that cultural conditioning would sort of have, the, have its own sort of challenges, or maybe it'll kind of ask for shift in practices to really accept these, uh, uh, the, you know, this kind of engagement that we have with, with uh, materials and objects around us. But, but on the yeah. other hand, I think this, this relationship of and I, that you or that you also mentioned uh, between our production processes and the and the natural uh, world, you know, I, I think that kind of also opens up this or maybe locates itself within this new space of um, 
a new space of thinking or maybe new space of uh, cultural production that uh, within which we sort of engage with 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 uh, materials and objects so yeah a hundred percent and like I want to actually bring this point up when I was introducing this project like at Carpenters and the objects were ephemeral uh, obviously there was a lot of hesitation you know nobody was okay with that <laughs> But there was somebody in the uh, audience when I was like introducing it who said that, you know, the their family was originally from Ghana and they were like, you know, indigenous houses are actually built that way, that they are built seasonally. But, um, you know, looking at the environmental conditions, they're built seasonally and that has changed. And most of this change happened, what, in the 1950s? with the invention of plastics, with the invention of like acquiring and owning as much as you can, right? So I think that we, the indigenous knowledge is there, but like it's about getting back to it, right? Getting, connecting back. And we are seeing like slowly that is happening. We are learning the ways, you know, that these ways are being documented. Uh, craft practices around the world are being documented. So I think that hopefully slowly like that relationship, there is a change and hopefully soon, because we need that change. Yeah, so I, if there are, I think there are, there is one more uh, question. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so I'll just read it out. Uh, trying to solve an existential crisis for us humans <laughs> through an approach like this can have a radical impact on how we live our lifestyles. But looking at our observations and processes, it really makes uh, me think out indigenous ways of thinking, how indigenous people live and gather information for generations. So as you mentioned that these biomaterials respond to the surrounding environment, it is, it's in. Suppose after spending time um, doing the experiments, we arrive at a product which can acclimatize to surroundings. Imagine having furnitures or clothes, absorbing toxins from air, especially indoors where we spend most of our time, it may even solve the problem of fast fashion. Okay, so, so that's the kind of comment or, or, or kind of a small question that he has. Okay. Sahil, yeah. Um, Sahil, can I, can I request him to come and ask his question? I think that will be much more um, better, no? Sahil, are you around? Can you, um, Sahil? Joel, can we have him? Yeah, thanks. So I'll go ahead with your question. Hello. 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 Yeah, Sahil. Yeah. So, can you be a little louder, Sahil? I think it's, uh, you're think very that, low. Uh, yeah. This yeah. mic is not working. Sahil, you're still inaudible. I mean, it's very low. I think maybe the headphone is not connected. Yeah. In the meantime, there is, uh, I think there is um, one more uh, question, uh, which we can take. Okay, I will just uh, stop the screen share. Is it okay? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yes. Um, So yeah, the question goes, are there any um, other dyes or natural fibers that you've come across or you've worked on? Um, Apart from these? Yes, many. Uh, like I said, I think kitchen is becoming like a bigger laboratory for me. Um, it's definitely COVID initially, it was kind of difficult because like, again, I had to like, you know, move my all my work to my house. But again, like, you know, when I was, studying when I got more involved in like cooking for myself like you know being in the kitchen it 
took that space of being that laboratory. So I started experimenting with cocoa mist dye, which is really lovely. Um, you can use mushrooms. Mushrooms have a range of color. Um, you can get a bright pink. Um, I think on Instagram, I have a few photos as well of like the different, cause I keep trying these, you know, tests now and then, and I keep like posting about it, but you have a range of colors that you can get out of mushroom. You have like you can forage, you can pick up like walnuts, you can dye with walnuts, walnuts give a lovely brown, um, safflower gives like a yellow, marigold, uh, genda fool has like a beautiful yellow. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can basically, there are so many people kind of working in the space of natural dyeing is so beautiful. It's also like such a nice uh, process because you can always like collect these forage them, collect these like, you know, um, natural um, flowers or seeds or things like that and keep them and store them, preserve them for a long time. You can dry them up and keep them. They will give a completely different color. I was also doing avocado. So with avocado, you can do or butterfruit also you can do, you can uh, dye with the seeds, you can dye with the skin. It gives a completely different color. You can dye with onion. Onion skins give a completely different color. So onion skin actually has a lovely pink. So there is a range that you can get with just natural dyes and the kitchen. All right, thank you. I, and there's there's one more comment, uh, one more question coming from um, um, from YouTube. Someone watching from YouTube. Uh, he's uh, oh, he's an ex student from the pool, uh, Ashwin. He asks um, when you um, talk about durability and the move or the shift to use the material in its raw condition. What then is the new idea of innovation in the world of materials, if not an exploration in durability? Because I think what he's trying to ask that all our current uh, ambitions are to kind of make it as durable as it can be. So what are the other innovations that are kind of uh, thought through right now? I think for me, um, I like, you know, with the hair project, you know that it's something innovative because you can use that as like a substitute for like fertilizer, right? Yeah. And in the math structure is the only way you can use it, which is actually a felted textile. So that is like something innovative, but it doesn't feel um, it doesn't feel extractive in any way because you are returning the material as nourishment, if anything else. So, I mean, with innovation, I think the approach should be more of sustainable innovation and not just innovation. So I think that that shift is happening and you can see it through the industries. There is a lot of investment as well into like, you know, sectors of sustainable innovation in architecture, in beauty, in like fashion, where more and more people are investing in that area. Um, there are also like, again, like, you know, the entire system is kind of problematic. It's not just the material choice you know, just the material choice being the problem. Um, you know, dying in the textile industry is such a huge issue. So it's a systemic like problem that can be addressed in different steps. You can be innovative in your approach, depending on what, what area you want to address. So um, we have messed up so severely that now we have the opportunity to actually, uh, you know, enter any of these stages and actually uh, and have like a solution or at least try an experiment and like offer different ways of approaching these problems. Yeah, and I, I think that in, on the other hand, um, in, instead of say posing it as a, a solution to the crisis, mm -hmm. I think it also, uh, it might be quite, interesting and productive in that sense to look at the the outcome of this as a new start to a uh, new set of raw materials new set of cultural conditions that may emerge from from where we are right now i think uh, and that's more exciting uh, and sort of you know uh, to look forward to than to yeah. sort of maybe uh, think of it in crisis so ashwin i think the innovation sort of also uh, kind of opens up from that position rather than, yeah. yeah. I, th I think especially with the kelp, like I did try to make it durable, usable, and I have made it into material that is durable, usable. Yeah. It might not last forever, but like I, 
decided not to just go with that approach because I think there had to be a, a way that we had to we had to shift or rethink the way we engage with things. And I think that that is also a part of the innovative process. So instead of like not taking that road and completely being like, oh, this is not going to lead into something functional, it's actually also delivering another set of knowledge that is equally crucial. Okay, so we have one one more comment. Um, thank you, Anuba, for this beautiful work. Uh, this is from Rupali. Um, uh, thank you, Anuba, for this beautiful work. The idea of tenderness, ephemerality, the kitchen as a laboratory has an interesting feminist turn to thinking of design, which has been masculinist and extractive for a very long time. Thinking of uh, entwining these two, these with ways of life and living further would be wonderful. Uh, Rupali, are you around? Can you, uh, would you want to sort of uh, elaborate further or? Uh, Joel, can we have Rupali on, on the panel? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, hi, hi. Thank you so much, Anuba. That was really, really beautiful. Um, and I mean, this just, just it was more a comment than a question. So uh, in terms of, I, I think it's uh, more than problem solving. Uh, it's, it's kind of thinking of an attitude right uh, kind of view of life and what does it mean to kind of you know completely uh in some ways turn our our sort of attention because uh, there's a certain process in which design has moved and it is it's there is uh, uh, it's it's almost like innovation has a certain uh u turn to make right and i think some of that the work you're doing is that u turn um yeah. But also not U-turn in the sense of, you know, going back uh, to a kind of primitive past that we've come from, but also kind of innovating from uh, the now of, of that U-turn, right? So I think it's really, really beautiful. And I think what would be nice is because, you know, also uh, designers think of themselves as individual uh, people, right, who are, who are innovating. But yeah. design has never come through in individual efforts. They've always come through a kind of collective logic, a kind of a distributive logic of thinking, right? That's how traditionally our, our, our design processes, architecture process, you know, all of them have moved. So I think what will be really nice to kind of look at this, this community of, of designers who are in that process of the, the U-turn, right? And, and kind of building from there. Um, and instead of thinking of design as a, uh, as an object out there, really starting to look at how do you entwine lives and, and attitudes and ways of, uh, you know, accepting things within uh, within us, right? So I think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful um, contribution to that uh, thought and the idea. So yeah, just, I mean, it's a comment there. Thank you. Thank you, Rupali. No, absolutely. I think you nailed that. It, it's true, like, you know, there needs to be a different way of thinking and approaching with material, with the way we design, the way we think, whether we're like building a large structure or a building, or whether even if it's a tiny object. Um, again, we have the power to mostly like kind of make that decision. And it's not just in terms of choice of material, but how that material reacts, interacts, how it's going to live. We were not really thinking of that for like very long because we were always so concerned with the final form. So I think now we have to kind of think of all the systems that are in place that actually contribute to that final form for us to get to that. So I think that this is, again, an opportunity to kind of, you know, uh, find different ways of engaging and exploring and experimenting. And I hope most people can like make use of that and get inspired by it. Right. Thanks so much. Thank you. And also, I think it reminds me of this, the whole idea of the nourishment. Uh, and I think material was not really seen through, um, through that lens. And I think that already speaks of that contribution or that it speaks of that new uh, cultural conditioning that we sort of can look forward to. So yes. um, thanks, uh, Hanuba. Thanks a lot for, for, for being here, for, for discussing your work and, and sharing your thoughts. Of course, thank you for having me. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Yeah. Bye.